Right, against that um, introductory video then, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Brian Gainsler. Um, Brian is Australian Laureate Fellow at the University of Sydney and Director of the Centre of Excellence for Sky Astrophysics. Um, very well known in his field, award winning, over 240 articles to his name, um, more than 10,000 citations and an H index of 60. So Brian knows a bit about making his name and it's going to be good to hear his experiences. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for coming, everyone. And um, thank you to the library for inviting me to, to come here and, and to give you a brief um, talk. So I'm an astronomer and so that the way in which we promote our research is, is somewhat different from many others. In the, on the one hand, astronomy is incredibly high visibility. Um, when an astronomer discovers a new planet or a new star, it cannot quite often be a big news story. On the other hand, it's a very small and specialised field, so you know, getting even three or four citations on a paper a year after you publish it is considered a good deal, a, a, a big deal. Um, there are many papers that get many more citations than that, but your average paper will just get a, a small number of citations. So there are some unique challenges. There's also some unique responsibilities that astronomy has because we see ourselves uh, as the gateway drug to science and engineering and technology. There are lots and lots of people who are working in some sort of science or technology focused area in their lives. And if you ask many of them why they chose that path, very often they say, well, it all started as a kid when I got into astronomy. So we have this sort of responsibility for all of science and technology and engineering and that everyone is excited by what we do. A lot of the concepts are somewhat more easy or familiar than some of the gory details of some other aspects of science. So we have to be flag bearers for all of science about promoting what we do. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we promote our research within astronomy and then about how we uh, deal with this responsibility of making science exciting and accessible to the rest of the world. And I'm doing this in the context of my, my job, which is as director of a centre of excellence, the Centre for All Sky Astrophysics. So while I still do my own research, more and more of what I do is all about facilitating the research of um, 150 or so postdocs and students. I'm actually very uncomfortable with the idea of self-promotion. I don't really like the idea of tooting my horn, but I get great satisfaction out of tooting the horns of my students and postdocs and making sure that people know about, about their work. So one thing to realise is that astronomy is a very fast moving field. Um, if you don't see a paper until a month after it comes out, then it's all over, everyone's moved on, it's too late. So for example, um, hopefully most of you heard the exciting news last Tuesday about this big discovery from the US of seeing the origins of the universe and this is going to change our understanding of gravity and cosmology and everything. Did some of you hear about that? So that paper was, re the press release and the paper were released simultaneously at I think 3 a.m. Sydney time on Tuesday. So how many papers do you think were written by midnight that night following up on that result? Want to guess, anybody? Six. Nine. nine. There are already nine interpretations of that result that were available on the internet, submitted to journals by um, less than 24 hours after that result became public. So if you're sort of thinking, oh, I need to get around to reading that paper and see if I have anything to say, maybe I'll read it this afternoon on the train, you're too late. Um, so it's a very fast changing field and there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes even before the papers get written. So pretty much the one-stop shop in astronomy for finding out results, no one reads journals anymore. I haven't opened a journal either electronically or in paper for 10 years and no one else I've spoken to has either. The one-stop shop is archive. Um, how many of you know about archive or have used it? So some of you, it's, it's, it's very much oriented towards science, not all sciences. But essentially it's a preprint server where anyone uh, can upload a preprint. Now it's up to you whether it's just a note that only has a place on archive and is never submitted to a journal. You can upload it when you submit it to the journal or you can wait till it's accepted. It's entirely up to you. Um, but, uh, and it's all grouped by categories, astronomy, computer science, biology, and then within astronomy there's uh, smaller subcategories. So this is just uh, last night I went to this and this is just showing you the 62 papers that have been submitted to archive in the last 24 hours and you can see it's just the whole here's yet another bicep 2 is this big cosmology result so there's already another paper interpreting this and on and on it goes way down the page 62 of them and today there'll be another 60 or 70. 60 or 70. Um, so um, astronomy has by far the largest uptake uh, 
on archive compared to other fields. Something like 90, 95% of all journal papers are posted to archive before they're published. And what that means in turn is that no one bothers reading the journal. Because if you look through the journal, all you're going to see is papers that you saw in archive three months earlier. Um, that also means that people look at citations. Uh, if you post to archive, you get about five times more citations than if you don't. In fact, most papers that are not submitted to archive never get cited. So why some people choose not to submit to archive, I have no idea. I asked someone once and they said because they didn't want somebody else finding out about their results. Um, <laughs> don't know where to start there. I guess, I guess they adopted the right strategy. Um, so uh, for some fields, um, archive is very powerful. It's free, it's instant, it completely removes the need to go to the journal. Now this raises a whole lot of other issues as to why do you even need journals. Um, I won't go into that now, um, but my view is that I only really trust or act on a paper on archive if it actually says that it's been accepted for publication, accepted, um, accepted. Um, sometimes you get submitted, comments welcome, so you sort of have this uh, community refereeing of your paper. This one, red flag, firstly it's on a result that only came out last week and it doesn't say its status, so someone's has written something up and who knows whether it's ever going to be published to a journal. So I might read this if I think it's interesting, um, but I'm not going to take anything it claims too seriously, especially if anything it says is a surprise, where these essentially have got this gold stamp, they have been refereed, the only thing that hasn't happened is they haven't been typeset and published yet, but to all intents and purposes this is the same as the journal article that I might read if I were to wait. So the number one way to promote your research in astronomy and perhaps in other fields is preprint servers, don't wait for it to get in the journal, get it out there in whatever format is appropriate for your field. And Archive meets all the requirements for open access of the University of Sydney and the Australian Research Council and everything else. As I said, it's got such a big uptake now that the reverse effect is, is that if you don't publish on Archive, no one will ever know that you've written your paper. So the first and easy thing to do is just put it on there. And you'll often, within a day, already get people emailing you, asking you questions, pointing out typos, asking to collaborate with you. I just spent this morning finishing off a paper that I'm collaborating with someone in Sweden who I've never met, and it all started because I put a paper on archive that got them really excited. Okay, so the other thing about astronomy is that this is too slow. It takes 24 hours for your paper to appear, okay? <laughs> Things have already finished by then. So there's a number of other ways in which astronomers interact essentially in real time. And this is happening more and more now. So the first is that there's actually an astronomy Facebook group. And apologies to all your astronomy buffs in the audience, but this is a, a private group that's only for professional astronomers. And it has about 6,000 members. Um, that's perhaps about 10% of all the astronomers in the world. I don't know what fraction of all the astronomers on Facebook that comprises. But um, essentially, it's a real-time discussion of things happening. So uh, there was a press conference yesterday to announce a discovery of a new planet in the solar system. And um, you know, within minutes, there are people um, both making social comments about embargoes, but also talking about um, the actual astrophysics of what it means, like where's the paper, have they calculated this, does anybody know, uh, is that related to this other result? And it's essentially unfolding in real time. And sometimes people will, you, know, you can attach photos to your Facebook chats, sometimes people actually attach plots or figures, and you can actually see a paper being you know, written on Facebook. Eventually at some point people will take it off Facebook if they actually want to get serious and move to email, but collaborations are forming in real time on Facebook. And that, that cosmology result last week, that was so dominant that they actually, a separate Facebook group was broken off just for that. And there are all the world experts in there like arguing the nitty gritty of, you know, look at equation 43, um, do you understand where that minus sign comes from? And so it's a sort of conversation you might have around a table, but these are people from all over the world, many of whom haven't met. And so it's a fantastic way both for me to find out about the big discoveries in astronomy, because what happens more and more now is I get a phone call from a journalist at some time of day saying, I need you to comment on some paper. It's a bit embarrassing if I say, what paper? Um, but of course, through this process, I'm pretty up to speed on all the news in astronomy, essentially instantly. And if you have big news, well, then you post it here. Um, it's not considered productive for every single person to put every preprint on this Facebook page. It would just be swamped. But people sort of internally calibrate and sort of when they know there's a big deal, a result that needs immediate feedback or that everyone's going to be interested in, they have no hesitation in posting it here. And it's all mixed in with other discussion about jobs and gender and uh, career paths and grants and everything else. So it's, it's a great way to fill in all those little 10 minute gaps in the day between meetings just to see what astronomers are talking about. But even this is not really fast enough. Um, sometimes, uh, in astronomy, the most exciting times in astronomy is when something unusual happens. A star explodes, okay? So the star goes boom, it lights up the sky, and it's fading away in real time. Like if you wait an hour, it might be too late to get some vital piece of information. 
So then even Facebook is sort of not the right way to interact because it's all coming up in real time, but you sort of have to know you can't really search or find it. So more and more now, um, uh, astronomers are reacting to exciting events using Twitter. Um, so in January, uh, a star exploded, a supernova, and it was the nearest supernova in about 30 years. So this is very exciting. Uh, 30 years ago, our technology was much more crude than it is today, and people basically needed to know in real time what other people had found. Should I bother pointing my telescope in this way, or are you already doing it? And so, uh, as always in Twitter, a, a hashtag just emerges naturally. In this case, the name of the supernova was Supernova 2014J, because it was the 10th supernova of 2014. And what you can see is uh, a discussion in real time. So this is someone actually saying, look, I've been able to get my telescope, and here's an image. Um, this is me, actually. Um, Saying, telling people that a radio telescope had observed it and, uh, and didn't see anything. And then, the, for some reason, the telescope themselves hadn't told anyone this yet, so they're retweeting me talking about their result. And here's somebody else um, posting an actual technical spectrum of, of the source. And we've even now reached the point where there are publications which have tweets in the, sites, in the citation list. So um, this is essentially happening in real time. It was quite exciting just watching this, essentially everyone yelling at once with the excitement every second a new tweet coming up. It was a great way to coordinate information, to remove rumours, to, um, to understand what was happening. So it's not that something is blowing up every day and everyone is dropping everything, but when this does happen, there's a fantastic way both to tell people what you're doing, to get the experts say, does anyone know how to calculate this? And within a few seconds, you've got some random astronomer tweeting back to you saying, yes, here's my phone number or here's my email, call me. Um, and the last thing I want to do is talk about the outreach side of things. Um, so, uh, the centre that I run, we decided to have a very strong commitment to outreach, mainly because of this issue that astronomy is just a natural way to get the public excited about science. So, here are some of the things we do. You can't necessarily do all of these, but the university offers many of these services and you should draw on them. So, we're lucky enough to have a full-time outreach and education officer. So, she's the one that runs the web page, who tweets, who updates the Facebook page, who writes the press releases. Um, some departments will have such a person. Um, the School of Physics that I work in also has an outreach person. But the university also, and most of the faculties also have media offices and so on. So we've set up a Facebook page, didn't cost us a cent, and we have 18,000 followers. And we have a YouTube channel that has 43,000 views. Now again, those don't cost you anything. If you have a, a group or a centre or an institute or a project and you think people will be interested in it, set up a Facebook page and tell people about it and just by word of mouth, uh, word spreads. So we try to pace things out. We plan ahead every few months as to how we want to tell people. We don't want to just overwhelm people with me, 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 or have nothing for six months. So we sort of roughly aim for a tweet a day, uh, a short story once a week, and about a month if, if we've got something to say, a press release. And our centre, about twice a year, puts out what we call a Reader's Digest. We essentially just print off every story uh, that's relating to our work, and we, we bind it, and we just print out copies and hand them out to people. And similarly, your department, if you have a bunch of different people blogging and putting stories, it's one thing to have a link on your web page saying, news archive here, but there's just a great value in printing them all out and putting them together. And when you go to a school or another department or have visitors, you just say, here's everything our department's been up to in the last year. It takes quite a lot of effort, but we also put together video press releases, which normally aren't that fancy. It's simply just someone talking uh, like you saw Deborah doing about their, about their work. And people just like clicking on a video rather than reading a story. We also have this Pint in the Sky video series where we have two astronomers, Katie Mack, who you can see there, and her colleague, Ellen Duffy, who go to the pub and just talk about astronomy while drinking beer. And we just record it and we film it and we put it on YouTube and people love it. We also uh, are developing, we're paying uh, de uh, uh, animators to make a media library of all our favourite ideas. In astronomy, it's all, some of the ideas are quite complex, and so we have a bunch of different animations to show the expansion of the universe or a star exploding. And now we're sort of really stepping up and trying to, to mess with the big players and that we have uh, approached Museum Victoria and said, look, we've got a, great, a bunch of brilliant people and great ideas. You make planetarium shows. Would you interested, be interested in making a planetarium show on real research? And so they've actually said yes. And so we're now uh, having a planetarium show in development. So not everyone can do all of those things. We're lucky enough to have the funding to pursue all of these things. But all of these things are reasonably simple. Some of them are free. Some of them cost a fair bit of money but they're all highly effective, both in telling people about you and what you do, but also just in general getting people excited about uh, research and about the value of research. 
There's a whole host of other things I haven't had time to cover, a lot of things that are amazing but sort of only specific to astronomy and how we do our research and how we promote each other. But that's sort of a quick snapshot of the sorts of things I do in my day, both to tell other people about um, my team's work and I think even more importantly to find out what everybody else in the world is doing too. Thanks a lot.